Hey, welcome everyone into the Wells Tech Garage for this month's training class. As you guys already know, we're here covering the second part of our Toyota EVAP system today. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at the vacuum pump key off system that's being used on vehicles that are from the early to mid 2000s range all the way up to uh, this model year. They are still using the vacuum pump system. It's a great system. It's been around for a long time and it works really well. So we're gonna spend a lot of time looking at that today. We're also gonna get into the two, well, let's call it three different hybrid systems that Toyota's running on the Priuses as well as the non-Prius hybrids. They're a little bit different, so we're gonna get into covering those as well. So let's get right into it. Um, first of all, thank you guys. Thanks for, for joining me today. And uh, looks like the comments are already rolling. So awesome, good to see you guys. I'm doing well. Um, I hope all of you guys are doing well and ready for a, ready for a little bit of a uh, little bit of training today. All right, a lot of new names out there. Good stuff. All right, let's start with the question for today. Now, um, I realized the one last time was a little bit difficult. Uh, we had a couple answers on that, so I decided to bring back multiple choice for this one. Uh, give you guys four potential answers. So the question today is a Toyota intrusive style EVAP system. And again, this is going to be a little bit of review to see who was uh, paying attention last time where we covered the intrusive style. But that system is running through its monitor and testing for leaks. All the conditions have been appropriately met. So uh, fuel level's OK, temperature's OK, all that stuff is appropriately met. Upon starting the car, the test begins. The PCM opens the VSV for EVAP, which is our purge solenoid. But the VPS, or fuel tank pressure sensor, is showing an increase in pressure, not vacuum. What is the most likely cause? A, a faulty VPS or fuel tank pressure sensor, a physical restriction in the system, is this normal operation or is the purge solenoid stuck closed? All right, so go ahead, email your answer out to me. Um, you have until the end of today, August 3rd, 2017. You have until the end of the day to email out A, B, C, or D. Um, and then also uh, shirt size or a hat if you'd like a hat, otherwise, uh, shirt size and color, we do the blue, gray, and black for the Wells Tech shirts, all right? So good luck. I hope you guys uh, paid attention last time and, and get it right. All right, so let's start right in on the, um, oh, and by the way, there is a link to my email address down below in the description of the video. Let's get right into this vacuum pump system. Now I'm gonna cover some overview stuff, we're gonna look at some pictures, and then we're gonna actually do some real world uh, testing right on the vehicle here. Behind me is sitting an 06 Avalon. Uh, this is the same vehicle that was in the class last time. Uh, like I said, these systems are um, very reliable, but in general they are pretty basic and many of the components are integrated into a single unit. So it makes the diagnostics very similar but the replacement much easier. You're not uh, searching over the entire vehicle looking for a specific component. So, um, commonly you're gonna find this system on almost every Toyota. You got a Toyota in the shop right now that's not a hybrid. There's a high prob uh, probability that this is the system that that vehicle has. Um, this system will run and pass the test more often than a standard like a uh, purge seal system or something like that because it's less likely to be interrupted. This system is testing when the key is turned off, kind of like an engine off natural vacuum leak test system, except they're using a vacuum pump. So the car will sit for five hours, go through a cold soak fuel stabilization period, and then from there, it will turn this vacuum pump on and draw vacuum on the system. All right, uh, our pump is typically mounted directly to the side of the canister, and sometimes it's replaceable separately of the canister, or sometimes it's going to come as the um, entire canister and pump assembly depends on how you buy it. We actually sell um, the one for this vehicle here, we sell separately. I'll get to that in just a second. The VPS and CCV, so again, that's fuel tank pressure and canister vent solenoid, are internal to our pump assembly on here, guys. There is not a standalone vent and there is not a standalone fuel tank pressure sensor on these. They are internal to our pump. So if you have a problem with one or the other, you're replacing the entire thing. Kind of nice, right? That way you get a new vacuum pump, a new vent solenoid, and a new fuel tank pressure sensor with replacing one component. In turn, this increases the cost for each of those components as they're combined in one unit, but you do get to replace them as a unit and um, kind of have, have new components for the customer's vehicle. All right, our system is going to be normally open. This is a vented system, not like our intrusive or non-intrusive systems where they are sealed. 
This system will be vented and then the CCV or vent solenoid will close when the PCM is doing the testing. Um, in the wiring diagram, you might see the VPS or fuel tank pressure sensor listed as the leak detection pump. Sometimes on some diagrams, you'll find that it is listed that way. Just know that that is, if it's got three wires going to it, it is your fuel tank pressure sensor. Um, and guys, be careful when you're testing parasitic draw on these vehicles, okay? These, these things will kick in that five hour mark, uh, five hours, seven hours, or uh, nine and a half hours, and I'll get to why in just a second. Um, but they will kick in. So if you're running parasitic draw on a vehicle like this, know that you're going to expect an amperage load at that five hour window mark if the conditions are met to run the test, okay? Keep that in mind. All right, so here's the system on paper. This is what it looks like. Um, as you can tell, it's, it's relatively basic in, in its build. We have our fuel tank, a uh, filler neck and a vent line going up to the, to the cap. And then we have a cutoff valve in the tank that's going to run to our canister. So one hose from the tank to the canister. On the other side here, we have a pump module, which then runs a hose off to our air filter. Um, and then this line goes to either an underbody air filter somewhere or um, potentially up to the air cleaner, depending on the model. And then we have a um, purge line. Obviously, we have to be able to purge the vapors from this canister, so that purge line is going to run up to our purge VSV or our purge solenoid, which then goes into the intake manifold. Many of these cars have a service port. This vehicle behind me here actually does not. Um, so when we get to some testing later, we will be testing on the canister side of the purge solenoid. Um, there's something unique about these assemblies, and that's this restrictor right here. And we'll get to that in just a second. But just remember that we have a restriction inside of this pump assembly. Um, so uh, let's uh, get to some pictures. So this is what it looks like. Um, I actually have it sitting over here. And let's uh, bring you guys along for the ride. Aha, the fuel tank with the upside down duckies. They're back. So I just want to show you guys, at, honestly, how basic um, the connections are, the hookups are for this system. We have our canister right here, and the one single hose going back to our tank. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that off. This is our canister assembly. All right, this hose is running to either an air filter of some kind under the vehicle or back to our air box. Um, this is our um, inlet or outlet air, air port, and it is filtered, um, which um, really helps with the longevity of the, of the vacuum pump. You know, think of. Um, the GM trucks where you're putting in that, uh, that air filter up above the transmission, same deal. You filter the air coming in, it's uh, going to last longer than it potentially would otherwise. Uh, and then we have our purge line here. Uh, obviously there's going to be hosing running under the vehicle, steel hose or steel line under there running to our purge solenoid. And then we have our connector here. Um, that's going to be seven pins in there in a 10 pin total connector. Seven of them are being used. So that is two for the vent, two for the pump, and three for the fuel tank pressure sensor. So that's really all there is involved with this canister, and the testing of it is, is pretty, uh, pretty. I, I don't want to say easy, but um, it's not as complicated as it would seem. So let's actually look at a couple other components here. I'm going to skip ahead. Let's go to the um, pump assembly or vacuum pump assembly. This is ESM 1042. This is the part number that we sell. This is a standalone unit. Um, that you can mount directly onto the side of the, the canister, all right? So this thing, like I said, has a bunch of components inside of it, so let's take it apart and take a peek. All right, the first part I want to talk about is the fuel tank pressure sensor. That is going to be right inside of here. You see this nipple right here? That is where the vacuum or pressure is going to flow into this nipple here and into this cavity right in here. That is where a fuel tank pressure sensor is on here, which is connected to three wires on this side. Um, I should have a close-up shot of that. Yep, there we go. So right here, guys, is that nipple again. That is where our vacuum or pressure is going to flow against the diaphragm of our, fuel, of our fuel tank pressure sensor. Here is the other half of that assembly. And uh, as you guys can see inside of here, there's a small like uh, filter element. This is what our vacuum pump is going to actually attach to. And then there's, there's this part inside of here. All right. This is very, very important to this system. This little green, green section right in here. This is actually a designed 20,000th leak. This is a 20,000th orifice. When this system tests itself, 
It figures out what kind of pressure reading a 20,000th leak looks like at that point, and then obviously we want to be able to beat that pressure, right? We want to be able to build more vacuum than a 20,000th leak. If we can build more vacuum than a 20,000th leak, we pass our test. So every time the system runs its test, it verifies and learns what a 20,000th leak looks like. And we'll get to the actual testing procedure in just a second here. But that is vital to this pump assembly, is this orifice that's in here. All right. And then we have our vent solenoid. This is just a standard two-wire on-off vent solenoid that you guys are used to seeing. Um, but this one's a little bit unique. It's actually got like a rubber um, protection in here that's going to help it uh, last longer. And then also, now we're used to a vent solenoid, right? You power and ground it and it would click, right? Well, that's not the case with this one. If we apply power and ground, there's no sound, okay? I'll hold it as close to my mic as possible. You guys can see the pintle moving up and down there, but there's no sound. All right, so don't get fooled on these, these vent solenoids will not click. All right, so don't be looking for that. But the vent solenoid is working, and we'll figure out how to, how to look at that in a little bit later. Um, this vent solenoid is then directly connected to this orifice in here, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, and then we get into the air pump. And it's just like it sounds, it's an air pump. Its job is to draw vacuum on the system. So, you know, nice and small, two wires running off of it. Now, this air pump does have a diode internal to it, so it can only pump one way. And we'll find when we look at it on the scope a little bit later, we're not gonna find power actually flowing through it when it's turned off because of this diode. All right, so you apply power, you apply ground, and there's our pump. All right, you guys can hear it. Now, you get a complaint from a customer that it sounds like something's running under the vehicle when it's sitting out in their garage. Well, if it's been after five hours, this thing will be running, right? It's going to be testing it for leaks. And then if we restrict it, you guys can hear it working a little harder. So that's our, our air pump. Now, my question always is, OK, we have an air pump on a vehicle. What kind of draw does this put on the system? If we're going to run this thing after five hours of sitting, what kind of draw are we putting on our system? Are we drawing our battery down? And the answer is, not really. You would think that this thing would be running at, I don't know, half an amp or so. It actually is only running around 50 milliamps or so. Let's take a peek at, uh, at what we got here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire this thing up in series. So I'm taking one lead of my meter onto the positive leg. I'm going to take the other lead of the meter and hook it up to the positive, going back to my power source. And then I'm going to hook up ground from the power source to the ground side here, turning this thing on and using the meter to flow the current through it. And let's grab the screen here. All right, so as you guys can see, currently we are running 0 0.047 amps or 47 milliamps. Now, if you remember on parasitic draw, our rule of thumb is typically, what, 50 milliamps or so? So if this thing we're running right now and you have any any milliamp draw on the system at all, you're, past, you're over your 50 milliamp rule of thumb. So keep that in mind. This thing is capable then of running up around the 100 milliamp mark. As you can see, if I block off the pump, we're getting close to the 100 milliamp mark. Um, temperature will, will have an effect on this as well. Getting reflection here, sorry guys. So that is the amperage on this thing. It's, it's very minimal, which is a good thing because we don't want a ton of amperage draw on a vehicle that's not running, right? We're not running the alternator right now. There's nothing on this battery to maintain it. So we don't want a huge draw. So 50 milliamps while this thing is running up to about the 100 milliamp mark is going to be normal for this, this pump assembly. All right. Um, all right. This is our purge solenoid. As you guys can see, we have it, it open right now. And this is what's unique about this purge right here. I want to talk about this for just a second because this could end up um, throwing you for a bit of a loop. So we have our purge solenoid, looks like a normal purge. It's got two ports and a two wire connection, you know, pretty simple. Um, the gray side here is going to the uh, intake manifold and the black side to the uh, canister on here. All right, so pop this cover off, just a simple screwdriver and a hammer, give it a whack, pop the cover off. We can look inside of here and as you guys saw in that picture, we have a screen inside of here, a filter. All right, the screen right here is blocking 
the canister side of the purge solenoid. So we have a canister that's failing, right? Okay, so we're shooting charcoal through the system. It would actually bounce off of this screen here and fall down into the recesses that are actually down inside of this. So if we look on the picture, you guys can see that there's like a recess down in here. If our canister were failing, this, this side of this right here would be filling up with charcoal particles. We would never see charcoal particles actually in our solenoid itself, but we would see them down here. What would eventually end up happening is this thing would be restricted to flow. So when the system opens this later on to bleed off of the vacuum to test it, it would be restricted to flow. So if you guys are replacing these purge solenoids for a restriction in the solenoid, pop them off. It takes two seconds in a vise, grab a hammer and a screwdriver or a chisel, pop the cover off, see if it's full of charcoal. If it's full of charcoal, you know that the system is failing. You will not see charcoal on the intake manifold side as long as the screen is intact, okay? I think the reason they do it is to keep charcoal out of our intake manifold. Seems like a good idea, seems like a, a nice, uh, nice bit of engineering on there, um, but it could really mask a failure. You could be putting purge solenoids on this thing every month for charcoal contamination when the root cause is a failing canister. And speaking of that, let's take a look at what I actually cut this canister open so you guys could see it. So here's what the inside of a canister looks like. This one's obviously empty of charcoal. All right, all the charcoal, well, most of the charcoal is in this cup. There was a lot more. I spilled it when I cut it open. But uh, these are just itty bitty little, little granules in there, all right? They're about the size of like, uh, I don't know, sprinkles that you'd put on your ice cream. That's about the size that they're gonna be. Um, and those will, if this thing breaks down, will eventually make its way into different components of your EVAP system. This is the other half of the canister. Again, we have our purge solenoid line. We have where our um, vacuum pump hooks up, and we have where the um, tank hooks up to here. All right, on the other side, I've cut the screens out so that you guys can see behind it. But basically, all we have here, guys, is this tiny little fibrous, screen in here that's keeping our charcoal inside the canister and not in our system. All right, so it's gonna look like this when it's, when it's new, okay? Now think of what happens to this little fibrous screen every time it's hit with fuel, all right? Whether it's fuel vapors or whether it's liquid fuel, this eventually will break down. If this breaks down, then we start shooting charcoal through our system, okay? So for the customer that um, always tops off the tank, saturates the canister with liquid fuel, these are gonna break down, you will shoot charcoal through the system, all right? So keep that in mind. At that point, it's probably time to have a conversation with your customer about topping off the tank um, because it's about to get expensive when you're replacing canister, potentially the purge solenoid flushing out any lines. Um, it's just a bad day for everyone. So that is the components that are found on this system. I think I covered everything. Yep. So that is that. Let's just take a peek at what you guys are saying here. <laughs> Keith is saying, I'm sure they would not taste like sprinkles. Yeah, I would think that they would not taste like sprinkles. I'm not gonna taste them. Keith, if you taste them, you let me know how they are. All right, Sandy donated five euros. Thank you, Sandy, for donating. Um, as I talked about last time, guys, we don't need you to be out here donating to us. Oh, sorry guys, let's bring you back on camera. My fault. All right, as I said last time guys, we don't need you to be out there donating. We appreciate it, but it, uh, we're not out here to, to make money off of you guys by donating through the channel, okay? But thank you. All right, oh, Eric donated as well. $20 from Eric, thank you Eric for donating. All right, it looks like he had to head out. He's on vacation right now and has bad connection. Wow, thank you. Keith donated. <laughs> Guys, what's with the donations? It's not necessary, but thank you. I do appreciate it. All right, just seeing if there's anything else here that I gotta, gotta mention. Let's actually pop this out so I can read it easier. All right, it's not gonna let me pop it out here. All right, well. That's all right, we'll get to it in just a little bit. I'll go through these again in a little bit. Let's get to the wiring diagram now. All right, so these wiring diagrams are, like I said, sometimes you'll find that this leak detection pump is labeled differently, or you'll find that the pressure sensor is labeled leak detection pump. For whatever reason, 
um, just look at your wire count, look at what it looks like in the diagram, and typically you can figure it out at that point. Uh, so we have power, ground, and signal for our pressure sensor. We have our motor right here. Um, this is our vacuum pump. And again, guys, this is important to note right here is this diode in here. This diode is important. All right. This diode is the reason why this is a vacuum pump and not a pressure pump. If that diode were to fail, if it didn't have a diode in it, you reverse power and ground on it, now you have a pressure pump instead of a vacuum pump. All right? We want to be only using vacuum on the system. That's what, it, that's what it's intended for, and that's why this thing has an internal diode. Okay? And just for um, reference, the diode is in the pump assembly itself. Uh, somewhere Inside of, inside of here is the diode. The diode is not in the, uh, the leak detection unit. It is somewhere in the wiring of this thing. Because if I hook this thing up backwards, it does not do anything. It doesn't move whatsoever. In fact, let me just show you guys. All right. So we're going to go red to black, and black to red. Nothing. There's nothing there. All right. And vice versa. <laughs> There's nothing there because the. Let's try this again. Turn the power supply back on. All right, red to red, black to black. It's running. Nada. All right. So there's a diode in there to protect it and to make sure it's only a vacuum pump and not a pressure pump. One other thing I wanted to show you guys quick is just that this thing is not creating a massive amount of. Vacuum, all right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to throw it on a vacuum gauge. You guys can hear that this thing is working really hard. All right, we're not even building up to, what is that, maybe one PSI at the most. So very small amount of vacuum being generated by this pump. So it's possible that when we're running our leak test after this thing's been sitting for five hours, we could have an extended time to run the leak test if our tank is really, really empty. You know, obviously we're still going to have parameters, you know, probably the 15 to 85 percent parameters for our fuel level, but if our tank is really empty, it's going to take longer for that small pump that's only drawing like roughly one PSI or so, or one, is this even in PSI? One inch of HG. Um, we're going to be drawing a very slight amount. It's going to take quite a long time to draw that entire tank into vacuum. All right, so that's our wiring diagram. That's the pump. That is the unit. Um, let's just check here again. All right, moving up DIY is here. All right, parasitic load testing would normally be done. Uh, yeah, Eric, normally you would do parasitic draw would normally be done within that 30 to 90 minute mark. I've been finding on newer vehicles that some, some of them you got to wait longer. Um, but nevertheless, they are almost always completed within the five-hour window. Um, let's see what else we got here. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. I, I thought that information was good because it, it, you, could, you could hook the up power and ground to that pump and you could measure it. Oops, sorry, guys. And you could measure it while it's still in the vehicle. And how do you know if it's good or bad? Well, the amperage rating will tell you. Um, obviously, if your amperage is way up, Potentially, you could blow the fuse. You could um, have a restriction in the pump, a restriction in the system. Amperage is a, is a good, good stat to know on that pump. All right, let's talk about the actual leak test that these vehicles are performing. So a lot of our scan tools can actually run this test in either a manual mode or an automatic mode. If you guys remember from the last class, I have the two tools here on the table. We have our snap-on tool and we have our launch tool. If you remember from the last class, the snap-on tool wouldn't even touch our 97 Camry, no actuation test, nothing like that for that one. And our launch tool would do that. Now, this one's the exact opposite. Our launch tool will do actuation testing for our different solenoids, but it will not run an automated or manual mode test on this vehicle. The snap-on one on this vehicle will run through the entire procedure, automatic or manual. So today we are going to be using the snap-on tool to run our test. Um, guys, the leak test has to run after the vehicle's cold soaked at least five hours. That is the, the time limit for the piece that the PCM sets out. After the key is off, you have a five-hour window. Now, this is dependent upon coolant temperature. 
If the vehicle or if the ECT is reading over 95 degrees Fahrenheit, the PCM decides that it's going to wait two more hours to run this test. If it is still over 95 degrees Fahrenheit, it will wait two and a half more hours. So we go from five hours to seven hours to nine and a half hours of total wait time just to run this test. After that point, if it is still 95 degrees Fahrenheit, you've probably gotten into the vehicle and drove it away. But if you haven't, it's because it's really hot out that day and this thing is going to decide not to run the test at this point. So ECT has to be below 95 degrees. So if you have a skewed ECT cell, uh, sensor, engine coolant temp sensor, if it is skewed, if it's not failing, but it is skewed, and say it reads 125 degrees all the time, you'll never run the EVAP monitor on this vehicle. Okay? Keep that in mind. If you have a vehicle that's not running the EVAP monitor, but it's got no codes, look at your ECT and find out what is going on with that. Um, if our test fails, it's probably time to start looking for a leak, and don't forget about your purge solenoid on here. I'll show you guys exactly what I'm talking about in just a second. Now guys, behind me here is a 2011 Prius, all right? I told you guys in the Tech Connect episode that I was going to have a Prius in here and I didn't want to be a liar, so there's a Prius in here. Unfortunately, this is the third generation Prius and it runs the exact same system that our 06 Avalon is using. So, unfortunately, it is not the bladder style system like I had hoped. Uh, that would be on Gen 1 and Gen 2 and we'll get to the bladder style here in just a second but um, it is the same system. Uh, just something to note with the 11 Prius is the canister is a heck of a lot easier to change out uh, as an assembly on the Prius than it is on this Avalon. On the Avalon, you're pulling the tank. Uh, it's like over two, two plus hours just to r, &R the canister on there, where our Prius book time is only nine tenths of an hour. So just something to note, a little bit of differences in location and mounting, uh, but otherwise the systems will operate exactly the same. So here is the steps in our leak test. They're labeled out as A, B, C, and D, and E. And when I get to the graph, I'll be able to explain that better. But basically, A is going to be our um, atmospheric test. Like I said, this thing is vented to the atmosphere at all times until the CCV or vent solenoid is turned off. This is going to run for 10 seconds. And basically, we're just, oops, sorry. Basically, we're just trying to get an atmospheric value. If that value falls outside of the 70 to 110 kPa mark, the monitor is aborted. At that point, there's either pressure or vacuum inside of the tank. There's something else going on. Restricted vent solenoid, restriction in the vent line, something like that, is causing this tank to build pressure or vacuum on itself as it's sitting. All right? It has to fall between the 70 to 110 kPa mark. If it doesn't, the test is aborted. At this point, if we pass A, we go on to step B. This is a 60 second test. This turns the pump on. Note here guys, the CCV is still open. Our vent solenoid is still open. Our system is still being vented to the atmosphere, okay? We will see, on our fuel tank pressure sensor, we will see a pressure reduction or a vacuum increase. We will build vacuum. This is that 20,000th leak test. This is that point of this unit right here that is so incredibly vital and also could throw you off very easily. Right? So you have a vent solenoid open, you turn on a vacuum pump, you assume you're not going to draw any vacuum, right? Because the system is open. Wrong. Anytime the vent solenoid is open on this vehicle, so un ungrounded, unpowered, whatever, as long as that vent solenoid is open, you turn the vacuum pump on, you are reading through a 20,000th orifice. You will draw vacuum according to the fuel tank pressure sensor. All right? You will not draw vacuum on the entire system as a whole, but you will draw vacuum according to the fuel tank pressure sensor. So keep that in mind. You could have the gas cap, and I'm going to demonstrate it in a little bit. You can have the gas cap off of this vehicle, turn the pump on with the vent open, you will draw vacuum. All right? It's only reading through that 20,000th orifice. So don't get thrown off by that, all right? That is our, uh, let's call it our, our verification. That is where we're looking, dependent upon temperature, uh, fuel level, volatility of the fuel, that could change our KPA reading. So we have a spec here, a window of negative 4.85 to negative 1.057 KPA for that spec to read. That is what's telling the computer what a 20,000th leak looks like. Now we all know that we want to get below a 20,000th leak. 20,000th is going to be our small leak or very small leak code. So we want to get below that. So we want to draw the system down lower than that threshold, lower than that KPA value. So what do we do? We close the vent solenoid. This seals the system. Remember how we talked about in the first class, the vent solenoid is kind of the back door? Well, we're closing the back door right now. The vent solenoid is closed. 
Our purge solenoid is being unpowered at this point. It is closed by, by nature. That is going to be a normally closed solenoid. So now both halves of our system or, or our system's doors are both closed. We are going to draw this entire thing down into vacuum. What we're looking for is that within our 15 minute threshold, we're looking for that pressure to decline to the point where it reaches below our initial 20,000th vacuum check. All right, that is our threshold. We need to get below that. If we stay above that, we have a leak. If we get below that, our system is sealed. All right, in step D, this is a 10 second test. We're gonna open up the purge solenoid. This is verifying if the purge is stuck open or stuck closed. If it's stuck open, obviously we will not build any vacuum in the system. If it is stuck closed, if we open the purge with the vent still closed and the vacuum pump still on, we should see a reduction in vacuum. We should see that pressure increase near the atmospheric mark very quickly. This will tell us that the purge solenoid is able to be opened and is opening fully, allowing the intake ma manifold to uh, suck up the vacuum that is in the system. Now, I have a graph of this that'll all make sense here in just one second. Step E here is going to be a re-verification test. So it's basically running step B again. It's going to take the system down into a 20,000th leak, and then it's going to start comparing the readings. All right, if step C is greater than E, the system's leaking. Obviously, if we're able, not able to pull as much vacuum as a 20,000th leak, our leak is bigger than 20,000th, we have a leak in the system. Now, the threshold for that is if we're between 20,000th leak and 20% of a 20,000th leak, we have a small leak in the system. If we are 20,000th of a leak to atmospheric pressure, we have a large leak in the system, um, either a, a large leak or a stuck open purge. Now that sounds kind of confusing, but when it's on paper like this, it's a lot easier to understand. So here's our graph. This is what the system is doing as we're running through our test. So right here is our 10 second verification window. This is where we're looking at atmospheric pressure. Then we turn our vacuum pump on. Notice, guys, the vent valve is currently off. Our back door is open right now. Our purge sound is currently off. Our front door is closed because the purge is normally closed. We turn our vacuum pump on, and we draw vacuum down on this system. But it's not drawing on the system. It's only drawing vacuum through our 20,000th leak orifice. So it will make it look like we're drawing vacuum on the system, even though our system is currently vented to atmosphere. All right, so this is our first check. At this point, now we turn on the vent valve. We should see an increase in pressure for a split second here because now we just started measuring the entire system, and the entire system probably does not have as much vacuum in it as a 20,000th leak at this point. So our vent valve is on, our vacuum pump is on. Now we start to draw a vacuum. All right, we're drawing vacuum. Right now, we're not leaking, right? We're below our 20,000th orifice leak. We're below that. So our system is passing the leak test. At this point, if we pass step C, what do we do? We open up the purge solenoid and make sure that it's able to be actually opened. It's make sure that it's physically able to open. We should see a very fast uh, return back to atmospheric level. And then after it sees that, it goes into step E, where we draw another 20,000th leak check. And then we start comparing. If our small leak is somewhere between our leak check and 20% of our leak check, we have a small leak. If it is above the 20% to atmospheric level, we have a gross leak. That is how it's able to determine large leak or gross leak against a small leak, all right? Here are all of the codes that this system can set. Now, I'm not gonna get into every code specifically. You guys can look up your code descriptions, look up your code set criteria, uh, do your homework on it. But what I wanted to draw up here was, first of all, there are some codes in here that are not generic. They're manufacturer specific. If you're using a generic scan tool on this vehicle, make sure, or make sure not to use a generic scan tool, I guess, at this point, because you want to be able to pull like this P043E, uh, 2401, 2419, and 2420 are all going to be manufacturer specific. Chances are a generic tool will not pull them. So be careful, you might miss out on codes related to your leak detection pump, okay? Also, what I want to note is the fact that you can have multiple codes for the same problem. So you can see a P0441 related to purge solenoid. You could set that either for a purge stuck open or closed. But if your purge is stuck open, you will also set a gross leak code, uh, P0455. All right. Similar thing when we get down here. We're looking at our leak detection pump. You have a vacuum pump stuck off, so your vacuum pump's not working. You could end up with a 43E or a 43F. 
as well as a 2401 or 2402 and a 2419. So keep that in mind when you're diagnosing these things, multiple codes could all be pointing to a singular problem. All right, multiple codes does not necessarily mean you have multiple problems in the system. It's possible that you have multiple problems, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have multiple codes. All right, and if you guys want, screenshot this. I don't know if you guys are familiar with screenshotting, but uh, I think this would be something nice to be able to save. So, you know, just uh, hit your print screen button and screenshot this and throw it in a folder. All right, save that. That way, next time you're working on a Toyota leak detection pump system like this, you have it readily available. Or come back and watch the video again because they always go out as a recorded unit after this class. All right, the Prius bladder system, I'm going to hold off getting to this for just a second because I want to play with the car here and show you guys exactly what this looks like real time. Before I do that, let's take a peek at the comments. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Ah, Keith, it's amazing to me with such a small orifice that it doesn't get plugged up as often as you would think. Keith, I think what helps with that is the fact that everything in this system is filtered in one way or the other. Whether it's the air being pulled in, the canister's got those little screens in it, everything in here is going to be filtered. So, in theory, we should never have contamination inside of that. Um, but, you know, things happen. And yeah, Brian actually brought it up right here, thus the need for filters everywhere. That makes total sense. Um, all right. Um, yeah, Tanner, you can find that in service information. Uh, Toyota, up until this point, has been very, very good with sharing uh, service information with us. Um, so that, that chart right, uh, right there, this is pulled right from Toyota service information. So you guys can find this through that as well. Um, they're very good. Also, this chart is as well. All right. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here to cover quick. Ah, yeah, you could use a first look, or I, I think you're referring to as a uh, pressure um, transducer. You could definitely throw a pressure transducer on this thing and, and uh, test this thing. Um. <laughs> Keith's asking if anybody was aware of the orifice in there. Brian said he was. Awesome. Uh, looks like a couple guys have to get back to work. The overly talkative, handsome fella from New York. Is that how you talk about yourself, Keith? That's awesome. All right, looks like Sandy's here. William's here. Hey, guys, how is the sound today? I did turn up the sound a little bit from last time. We had some, uh, some questions about the sound. Does the, the level on the sound seem pretty good today, guys? Let's see what you think of that. Let's get into some lab scope fun. Oops. All right, guys. So here, I already have the scope set up to help save some time. We are looking at a 20,000, uh, excuse me, a 20 second per division. So we are looking at a, a relatively large amount of time here. Um, I wanted to look at a large amount of time because we're going to be watching this thing as it sits over, over time. I also have everything labeled up. Channel A is going to be our fuel tank pressure sensor. B is our CCV or vent solenoid. C is our vacuum pump. And D is going to be our purge solenoid. All right, I also have our voltage scales, B, C, and D are all sitting on the same scale, zero, uh, zero right here to 12 volts up to 20. And then our fuel tank pressure sensor, you can see we're zoomed in really far, I'm actually 4X on our offset here, so that we can see really close in on this sensor. We're really only looking at about a two volt uh, swing on our fuel tank pressure sensor. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna grab the key, turn it on, and we should see some values change immediately just on key on. Oh, and if you guys are wondering why it's starting over here, I learned a little trick while I was at Auto Mechanica from uh, one of the Matt Fanslow classes about using a single trigger in a range that it can't pick up in order to keep this thing scrolling in real time. Otherwise, we would be going through a full screen, and then the screen would reset and go back to, to one again. It would come back to here. This way, if you set a trigger um, when we're in the longer time zones, you set this trigger out of range, 
it will play this back real time. So that's why we started over here on the right side instead of the left. So upon key on, you guys can see that our vent solenoid shot up to 12 volts, and our um, gold would be our purge solenoid also shot up to 12 volts, which we would expect to be normal because the power is going to flow through our solenoids um, to the PCM until the PCM decides to go ahead and ground it. There's no load in the circuit right now until it's grounded. Uh, you can also see here our canister um, vacuum pump did not shoot up to 12 volts, and that is because of our diode that's internal to that pump, okay? So you should expect this to read down around the zero mark. Okay, so here's our fuel tank pressure sensor. We are currently right around the 3.4. It is kind of a messy looking sensor. We have a lot of bouncing around in here, but we're really only moving about two tenths of a volt. Um, and we are looking at this relatively fast, looking at about a million samples. So it is fast and it, it does look kind of messy, but we'll still be able to see the change. All right, let's go into the scan tool. Now, like I said, I have the key turned on. I'm gonna go into system tests and uh, we'll be able to watch the scope and the scan tool at the same time. And I'm gonna, we could choose automatic if you want the thing to run through it yourself. Now, because I wanna stop and talk about things, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna choose the manual mode to check each step of the procedure. And in fact, I'm gonna bump back to the procedure so we can look at steps A through E. And uh, let's bring our scope back up on the screen. So obviously we're gonna be measuring the purge vent and vacuum pump. Uh, so this is kind of telling you some system operation for each step. It'll stop the vacuum pump when pressure reaches a certain level to protect the system, so that's good, that makes sense. Um, it's also telling us to not operate them continuously for more than 15 minutes at a time because we don't want to go burning up solenoids. Uh, ignition on, engine not running. Again, this is a key off system, guys. The engine is not running when we're testing. Fuel level less than 9 tenths, fuel door closed, um, and fuel temperature below the 95 degree mark. As we load here, let's just take a peek at what you guys are saying. And actually, I'm gonna, let's, um, let's bring up the other camera. I'm gonna go in and change this quick. There we go. All right, I'm gonna change this quick, guys. Um, that way I get chat on the full screen if this will load. Come on. Hey, there we go. Okay, now we got it on the full screen. Let's just make sure you guys aren't, uh, have any questions. Yeah, uh, that, that trigger trick was definitely that definitely made me made it worse sitting through. I took an introduction to Pico class just because I wanted to see if there was anything that I was missing. You know, I've used the Pico now for eight months or so since since December of last year when Pico was nice enough to send it to us. Been using it since then, and uh, there's always things that you maybe miss or don't think of. And sometimes those introduction classes contain some of the best little tips um, for for training. I mean, just. Just being able to watch this in full time, in, in real time, instead of having it, you know, skipping screen to screen like it, like it normally would, it's, 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 it's awesome to see. It, re <clears throat> it really is. All right, so let's look at our scan tool right now. We are in the atmospheric pressure check. So the scan tool is listing it out here, and I know it's kind of small, guys, but I wanted you to be able to see both on the screen. We are currently on step one of six. Um, they label it out in numbers one through six where I labeled it out as A, B, C, D, and E. So A would be one, B would be two, C would be three, and so on. Um, oh, also guys, just to mention where I'm hooked up right now, uh, like I said on this one, the canister was kind of a pain in the rear to get to. Um, <laughs> no pun intended, because it is in the rear of the vehicle. Um, <laughs> the uh, canister and the connections were hard to get to, so I went directly into the PCM. You can see this is the, the passenger side of the dash. Pull the glove box out, takes two minutes. And you can see I'm back probed into the back side of the PCM connections. All right, so let's look at what we got here. So right now we are reading a vapor pressure of 736.2 um, 
230 would be our absolute or right around atmospheric at gauge pressure, all right? And as you guys can see, purge is off, vent is off, and vacuum pump is on. Now I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to hit continue. This should take us into step two. And step two was the step where we turn our vacuum pump on. So right away we see our green channel bump up to the 12 volt mark. There we go. So green is our vacuum pump. We bumped it up to 12 volts. And immediately our fuel tank pressure dropped. Now guys, again, this is not I say fuel tank pressure because that's what the sensor is called, but this is not truly fuel tank pressure at this point. And I'm going to prove it. One, purge solenoid hose is in my hand. All right? We're still in vacuum. Let's go one step further. Gas cap's in my hand. We're still in vacuum. All right? We are not measuring vacuum on the system at this point. We are only measuring vacuum on our 20,000th orifice, all right? Step two is on the 20,000th orifice, all right? This is our leak check. This is telling us at what pressure 20,000th of a leak looks like. Now we go on to number three. Number three, it's telling us that it'll turn the, act, the vacuum pump on and the vacuum reading will gradually increase. Thank you, thanks for that. It's gonna close up our vent. We'll see our red line here went down to zero. Let's grab that. So red line went down to zero. This is telling me that our vent is off. Uh, excuse me, our vent is on, uh, sealing the system. And as you guys can see, we are slowly drawing vacuum on our system. Right now our vent is closed and our vacuum pump is on. And as we watch this blue line right here, we're going to see it slowly start to decay. And again, the goal of this is to eventually get this line to show up below our 20,000th leak check right here. If it's above it, well then depending on which threshold it's at, we'll um, set either a large leak or a small leak code. All right, so we're gonna let this thing sit for just a second. We'll leave the scan tool up on the screen so you guys can see that we're still drawing, drawing vacuum on here. Let's take a peek at what you guys are saying. All right, Bryn said doing a great job, thank you. Um, I'm actually gonna grab these quick guys because I don't wanna run into that issue that time where, uh, huh, I already have, that's, that's too bad. I already missed out on some of the comments because uh, YouTube actually buffers the amount of comments you're allowed to have. All right, let's get back to the scope. You guys can still see that we are decreasing in pressure or building vacuum. And remember, where we started here, this was atmospheric. I'm going to grab a cursor and bring it down here. So I would call this the peak of our 20,000th leak. So again, our goal is for our blue trace to get below this cursor right here, and it's, it's on its way down. It looks like it's doing pretty well. And right now we are at a 15, negative 15.65 millimeters of HG. Now guys, I'm no scientist. I don't know what exactly millimeters of HG means. So what I do is I just go like this, negative 15. Well, we're, now we're reading negative 17. Let's just go negative 17 millimeters of HG. We are currently reading about a negative one-third of a PSI. I understand PSI better than millimeters of HG. So, so we're still decreasing. At some point, if the system draws enough vacuum, it will um, shut itself off. But right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hit continue and go to step four. We will see our gold trace move as our purge solenoid is opened. And I don't know if you guys can hear the clicking on there but it's cycling the purge solenoid and it's attempting to um, release the vacuum that's in the system. This is interesting. I'm surprised it didn't just open up 100%. It's actually duty cycling it and our pressure is slowly increasing. As you guys can see, we are duty cycling this on and off and it's slowly increasing our pressure back to zero. According to According to this, it looks like it just turns it on 100% and we should see our pressure come back up. So I don't know if this is something to do with the scan tool, um, scan tool software. And actually, guys, when I run this thing through an automatic test mode, it cycled the purge solenoid dead on 100% and my pressure came up very quickly. I don't know if this manual mode is to maybe test with a gauge then also, but uh, we are currently not doing what I would have expected to see. But nevertheless, we are reducing the vacuum inside of this system. It is coming back up to atmospheric level. 
So let's go on to number five. So again, we're um, opening up our vent. Our vent is now open, and just our vacuum pump is on, and we are re-pulling our 20,000th leak check. This will run for, I believe it said 60 seconds in the test. And then step six, we should read complete everything off, go back to atmospheric like it's supposed to. And it looks perfect. Our purge and our vent are both off, and our vacuum pump is back at zero volts. We are back at atmospheric levels where we belong. So that is the, what the leak test is doing in real time. Um, this is what's happening in your vehicle five hours after it's shut off. This is what it's doing. Now, there's a, a couple of, of things to watch for on this, guys. First of all, watch for your purge solenoid causing issues, um, being partially stuck open, or not um, returning that vacuum level fast enough. Um, seems to be common. This one actually has a, actually let me, uh, let me show you guys under here once. I'll show you where the purge is, and actually I'll show you a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a gripe, but as a, as a tech, it's very difficult to determine which solenoid you're replacing on these Toyotas. I'm sure for those of you that have worked on a lot of Toyotas, you probably know this already, but um, we have this sticker under the hood that's nice enough to show us. Let's take a peek at that. I snapped a photo of it. Here's our vacuum hose routing diagram. Why couldn't they, they just label this as the purge solenoid or, or something? <laughs> I mean, they're PWM vacuum switching valves for for two different valves, and then we have a standard vacuum switching valve. The only way that you know that this is purge is because it goes back to the canister. All right, so keep that in mind. This vehicle has three VSVs sitting under the hood. So if you get asked by a parts counterman what VSV you're putting in, you need to specify. And sometimes it's best to just take the part with you and match it up. So again, this is our purge. This is the, a new one on here, that one that I showed you guys earlier was actually the one that was off of this vehicle that was stuck slightly open leaking. All right, if we want to do a um, smoke test on here, so you have a leak on the system, and oh, you have a um, leak or something going on in the system, so you want to smoke test this. This thing's super simple to smoke test. All you got to do is find somewhere to go in, so whether it's through the purge solenoid, um, let me grab my... Uh, Need this guy. Whether it's through the purge, the canister side of the purge solenoid, or if it's got a port under the hood, you can go into either. I'm going to go ahead and go into the purge port. And by the way, guys, if you're looking for an under hood light, this thing is awesome. All right, Milwaukee was nice enough to send us this. I mean, I don't know if you guys are Star Wars fans, but this thing's probably about as close to a, a lightsaber as you could get. I mean, it's pretty awesome, but it's super bright for under the hood, and it's wireless. And it just runs on your M12 batteries if you guys have Milwaukee stuff already. So um, purge solenoid, hooking up the smoke machine. I'm just going to smoke back to the canister, just like before. And of course, if we want to smoke test the system, what do we have to do? We have to close up the back door, right? We've got to close up our vent, and then we should um, be able to smoke the system. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go into actuation mode, grab our vent. And as it loads here, hopefully turn it on. I'll, I'll have the scope up on the screen, guys, so you can see the fuel tank pressure as well. Um, I'm not going to bother with data PIDs just to save on time. Uh, but at this point, I'm just going to close up our vent. We just saw it on the scope. It went low. Our vent is now closed. And let's go ahead and start applying smoke into this thing. And we should see our blue line here start to increase. And already, it's starting to increase like it's supposed to. So we're building, obviously we're building pressure inside of our system. All right, now let's uh, just take a walk back to the gas cap and you know like I talked about in that uh, one Tech Connect episode was to always verify that you're actually getting smoke where you think you're supposed to be getting smoke. This is what I always do also. I'll walk back here, lock the camera in place so it doesn't move on me. But I'll pull the cap off and just make sure I can hear it, but make sure we actually have smoke. Let's grab a light. So 
it's probably really hard for you guys to see. I don't know if you can kind of catch a, a little cloud of smoke there or not. Boy, it's, but I guarantee you there's smoke coming out of there. Oh, you can see it a little bit there. So there's smoke coming out of there. Go ahead and seal it back up. Let's see if the system builds pressure. And our scope should show us exactly what just happened. We were building pressure. I opened the gas cap. So it, it allowed the smoke to come out of the gas cap and now we're building pressure again. So now at this point, guys, it's just a matter of looking for your smoke or if you have um, one of the uh, ATS test kits, the bullseye test kit, you know, start pressurizing it with the CO2 and use your sniffer for that. And I'm gonna, I have one of those kits here in the office. So at some point, guys, down the road, I will be doing a video demonstrating that kit as well and, and how, it, uh, how nice it is for finding EVAP leaks. All right, so this is doing exactly what it's supposed to do, and it's, and it's super simple. And if you don't have a scan tool to run the vent solenoid, send power and ground to it. Or turn the key on because it's, it's fed power with the key on. Put a jumper wire to ground and you're done. All right, so that is the system. That is the leak detection system that we are seeing on most of our newer, or almost all of our newer Toyota vehicles. All right. Just seeing what you guys are saying. All right. All right, Bob's here from Hayward Automotive. Hey, Bob. All right, good stuff. All right, you're getting a new ladder, all right. Well, Bob, you can always watch it again later like you normally do, so great. All right, guys, let's, uh, I wanna cover these hybrid systems. I know we've already been here an hour. I'm gonna just kind of uh, breeze through these hybrid systems very quickly um, because there's not a lot of, I guess there's not a lot of failures with them, I would say, um, but you'll see less of them in the shop. So let's cover, first of all, the Prius bladder system. And again, unfortunately, guys, the 2011 Prius is not using the bladder system. This would have been typically on the Gen 1 and Gen 2 Priuses. All right, so why is it the bladder system? Well, because there is a bladder inside of our physical fuel tank, all right, that expands and it contracts with fuel being put into the tank or, excuse me, into the bladder, or fuel being taken out of the bladder to be used by the vehicle. Think of it kind of as a balloon inside of the tank, okay? Fuel tank, bladder inside of the tank, okay? Not like a, um, a race car that's got a fuel cell, this is gonna be completely different. There's a bladder inside of here that's gonna expand and contract when you add fuel to the vehicle inside of our overall tank assembly. Now the reason they're doing this and the goal of this is to create less vapors than that would normally be created inside of a fuel tank because a hybrid engine is not always going to be running. We don't want to have to start up the internal combustion engine, cut down on our overall fuel economy just to purge off the system. So the goal here is to create less vapors by having a, a, a bladder that expands and contracts that doesn't allow um, the vapors to build up. There's no room for the vapors to build up. If the fuel and the bladder are the same size, there's no room for vapor to build, it's all liquid inside of there. But the system is still using a purge solenoid. It is still using a vent and it is still using a fuel tank pressure sensor. Now, in normal operation on a known good system, you should not have fuel vapors being purged by the system, okay? If this bladder were to start leaking, then the system would be purging fuel vapor. So to note, guys, if you're looking at an EVAP system on a uh, Prius vehicle, you open up the purge solenoid, watch your fuel trims. If your fuel trims go positive, that's normal operation, right? We're sending just pure air or whatever's surrounding inside of this tank, we're sending that into the motor and we need to add more fuel with it. If our fuel trims go negative, if we are reducing fuel because we have rich fuel vapors entering into the intake manifold at that point, then we know we have a failure inside of our bladder, inside of our system, okay? Watch your fuel trims on these systems. They will react differently on that initial opening of the purge. Um, our fuel tank pressure sensor, our VPS, is going to be monitoring the pressure or vacuum inside of the tank, not inside of the bladder. It is mounted outside of the bladder. Prius has also run two different systems that are similar in design 
and they operate similar, but they are definitely different. So I'm going to start with the first one, which is the older model. And this is what it looks like on paper. We've got a fuel tank connected to our filler neck. Obviously, this is our bladder. We have a um, runoff hose here. We have our main hose going to our pump. This is going to be feeding our pump with fuel. All around here, then, is going to be air or whatever happens to be traveling in and out of our vent solenoid and fresh air valve right here, okay? This outside part is vented. Now, why is it vented? Well, you cannot fill a sealed container. You cannot force something in or out of that sealed container without having some sort of vent to atmosphere. And I'm going to prove that right here. There we go. All right, so as you guys can tell, this balloon is in here. I got it rigged up through the top of this container so that I can fill it with air, all right? So there's a hole in here. I'm going to fill this thing up with air. Obviously, we're not using fuel or a liquid. We're using air, but the principles are the same. So if this container were completely sealed, if our tank were, were sealed closed, let's say that our vent sauna was completely plugged up. If you try to fill up your fuel tank, you're going you're gonna to see the entire thing expands. All right, you're able to fill in here, but you're building up a ton of pressure inside of your system, inside of your tank. So we have to have some way to vent that off. And now it's going to happen the same, same way except the opposite. If we fill up our bladder, all right, so we're now dumping fuel into this thing. Ooh, that looks like a sharp edge in there. I don't want to pop the balloon. Um, so we fill up our bladder. And now let's say that our system were plugged. Let's say our vent is plugged now. Let's take a piece of tape, and I'm just going to stick it over the vent hole that I have on this thing. All right, we're going to seal this up. Now we're using fuel on this thing, okay? The vehicle's running down the road, we're using fuel. Our bladder stays inflated now. All right? Because there's no way to vent this system, this our tank right now is holding vacuum and it's actually holding our bladder open, which now allows for fuel splash inside of our bladder, which could lead to an excessive generation of vapor and pressure inside of this thing. So if we were to have a normal operating vent, you'll see that as soon as it's good to go, our balloon goes back to normal, okay? So our bladder system is very, it is very important to have an operating vent system on these, on these bladder style systems because our purge solenoid is not directly pulling anything from the bladder, all right? It's only pulling from the tank itself, all right? Purge uh, vent solenoid vital on these systems. Or vent v, uh, VSV for CCV if you want to do it in Toyota terms. All right, so this is what the system is going to look like in normal operation. Um, this will be like purge mode, something like that. Again, we should not see fuel vapors outside of the tank, uh, excuse me, outside of the bladder, inside of our tank. So we're going to draw all of this fresh air or whatever might be in here, stale air, whatever you want to call it. We're going to draw it up through our canister, through our bypass switching valve, and then through our purge into the intake manifold. All right, you guys can see we have two different paths right here for, for travel. And this, is, this path changes by this bypass valve right here. It's good to note that our vapor pressure sensor, our, our fuel tank pressure sensor, is always going to be reading fuel tank pressure no matter which direction this bypass is. It's not going to change, okay? If we go into test mode, leak test mode, we now change the direction of this bypass and now we're reading directly down this line to the fuel tank. All right, we kind of take the canister out of the loop. Now it's still going to have to be sealed with the system, but now we close up the vent, we switch over this bypass, we turn on the purge, draw vacuum on the system, and then it's just like a normal purge seal system. We're going to watch our fuel tank pressure uh, change dependent upon leak size. All right. Here's a wiring diagram for it. Nothing too fancy here. We have a VSV for EVAP, our purge solenoid up here, power and ground. Then we have, looks like a junction here running uh, purge flow switching valve. This is our bypass and our vent. They are both uh, power and ground, ground side controlled by the PCM. And then we have a three wire vapor pressure sensor, fuel tank pressure. So nothing too, um, too crazy going on there at all. Um, pretty, pretty normal, no high voltage lines or anything like that running to the EVAP. In fact, let's, uh, let's take a look at the underside of this Prius really quick, uh, just to show you guys that you don't need to be afraid 
because it is a hybrid. All right. So we all know hybrids, big, scary, orange, high voltage lines. Well, as you guys can see, here's our vapor canister on this system. Oh, sorry guys, I'm losing you. Here's our vapor canister on this system, okay? Nothing fancy, don't see any orange scary cables here. All right, and like I said, this one's only quoted at 9 tenths of an hour, but we have the same principles. We have our hose here running to what I'm thinking is a tank or maybe an air filter of some kind. Wire connection, this is coming in with seven wires again, two for the vent, two for the vacuum pump, and three for our um, fuel tank pressure sensor. And then we have a filtering element of some kind. And then we have our canister. I don't know, this might be like some sort of noise reducer or something too, potentially. Because you wouldn't have a filter on the vacuum side. Unless that's a secondary part of the canister potentially. But there's nothing big and scary back here. Um, there's no orange high, high voltage cables or anything back to the canister. So you guys don't need to be afraid to do a, work on a check engine light on a, on a Prius for an EVAP problem, okay? And these uh, bladder systems, same way. You don't have to worry about high voltage lines going to your EVAP system. Obviously, when you're lifting the vehicle, be careful. Um, you don't want to crush those lines or anything like that. Lift in the lifting points. Um, but uh, other than that, once, once you're up working on it, it's pretty straightforward. All right, so then we bump into the later model bladder system. This model is actually going to use a vacuum pump assembly similar to this, all right? What else is unique about this is the fact that it actually uses two canisters and two vapor pressure sensors, all right? So this system is going to get a little bit more complex, but what's nice about it is now you can compare the pressure sensors between the two, all right? So the system is basically using a key off system like this one is with a couple other components in it. You're going to diagnose it pretty much the same way, but let's see what it looks like. So you can see it looks almost the same. We have our bladder in the tank running to our fuel pump. We have um, all the air and stuff around here. Here is our trap canister with pump module. So here's our leak detection pump and a trap canister. Okay, This is our smaller canister. And then we also have our normal size canister over here with a pressure switching valve here. All right, so this is all operating the same way as it was before. Here's a wiring diagram. You can see part of our leak detection pump module, canister pump module. We have our sensor pump with a diode again and a vent solenoid. And we also have our other vapor pressure sensor. All right, now what's, there is, um, this is looking very familiar, right? We sit in atmospheric pressure. We turn on the leak detection pump with the vent off. We are pulling a 20,000th leak check. At that point, we close the vent, pull vacuum on the entire system, right? If we fall below our 20,000th leak check, great, we're happy. We pass, open up the purge, bleed off all of that vacuum, should return quickly if our purge is good to go, and then pull another 20,000th leak check. So it's the same way, diagnose it the same way, smoke it the same way. Um, it is going to be the same style of system, just with a couple more components um, to look at. Then we get to the last system that Toyota is using, and that is the hybrid closed system. Now, this system is going to be on vehicles that are non-Priuses, okay? So if you have uh, like an RX 350H or something like that, a 450H, um, Camry hybrid, any, a Highlander hybrid, any of the non-Prius hybrids are going to be using this hybrid closed system that we're seeing on newer vehicles. It is also possible for them to use a leak detection system like this one, but um, we are seeing a lot of these newer hybrid closed systems. Again, consult your service information as always to figure that one out for sure. This is a closed style EVAP system that uses a vacuum pump. Now there's a couple key words in here. First of all, closed style and vacuum pump. We, are still, we still have a vacuum pump on this system that's being used for the test, but this system is closed, okay? What does that mean? Well, first of all, we need to understand why. A normal system when purging will draw a slight vacuum on the tank. That slight vacuum allows for room for fuel vapors to grow. All right, our fuel vapors grow and we get a pressure increase. Now our goal of a hybrid system is to reduce the amount of fuel vapors that are built in the first place. We wanna have low fuel vapor content. So if we have an entirely sealed system, 
like this, with our vent closed, we don't have room for fuel vapors to grow, right? We cannot, well, I should, <laughs> we could, under the right circumstances, I expand this tank through pressure. If you overpressurize, it could expand the tank or contract the tank. Think of your gas cans. If you have a sealed gas can at home, leave it sit out in the sun, the tank expands. Leave it sit in the cold, it contracts. Same thing with this. This system is sealed and should do the same thing. The tank and the canister on these systems are split. Um, similar to our systems that we talked about in the first class, there's going to be a door in between, a bypass valve in between that's going to split these systems. The system allows the tank to build pressure, and when purging, the computer will typically not open the door. Okay? We're going to use that door, let's call it like our, similar to our vent sonar, that'll be our back door. Okay? Our bypass on these systems is kind of like our back door. So we are going to draw vacuum on only the canister side of the system. We are not going to be drawing vacuum on the tank side. All right? We don't draw vacuum on the tank because by drawing vacuum, we increase the potential for fuel vapors to, to, um, to, be, to be built. So there's a couple different uh, names for things here. We have a fuel vapor containment valve. This is that bypass valve. All right? This is what's isolating our tank from our canister. This is that door that's opened and closed by the PCM. We also have a fuel outlet valve. This is a mechanical valve that opens during overpressurization in the tank. So if we're filling the tank and we need to be able to get a lot of pressure out very quickly, this valve will open to accommodate for that. If our system, if it were really, really hot out, you know, you're, you're in Arizona parking on blacktop, it's super hot that day, 115 degrees, that overpressurization valve may open and allow that pressure to bleed off into the canister. But in normal operating conditions, our fuel tank on these systems is going to be standalone, sealed from everything else. The system uses the vacuum pump to check for leaks. All right, we'll get into that in just a second. Here is what it looks like, and it's relatively basic. We have a fuel tank, filler neck, we have a couple valves in here running up to our fuel containment valve and our um, bypass valve or our um, fuel outlet valve. This is that overpressurization valve, and this is that door that the PCM controls. Going back to our canister, which is drawing in fresh air through some sort of filter. And then we also have a line running to our purge solenoid. All right. It's also important to note, guys, that there is no vent valve on here, right? There's no CCV on this system, OK? So that's going to play in in just a second here. But note, guys, that this looks to be open at all times. I don't mm, This pump module might have a vent in it actually. Let's look further. Here's our wiring diagram. You can always look at your wiring diagram to verify what is in the system. So we're questioning right now what number 10 is. Number 10 says it's a canister pump module. Now if we're going off of our canister pump module and our other vehicles, we would assume this to have a vent in it. So let's take a look. Starting at the top of the canister pump module, we have a fuel tank pressure sensor followed by a motor. I'm going to assume that to be the vacuum pump. Followed by a two-wire solenoid of some kind that seems to be not labeled. We have to assume that this is a vent valve, because here we have our fuel containment valve, and here's our purge. So the system does use a vent valve. Even though, guys, it's not called out in this diagram as a vent valve, the system is using a vent valve. All right. Here's the codes that the system can, can set. Again, be careful with a generic scan tool. You might not be able to get these specific codes. All right, so keep that in mind. All right, here's where it gets messy. Here's where we start running the test on the system. And if you notice, it is very similar to the leak detection pump style, except for we have this and we have two different pressure sensors right here. All right, so our canister pressure is vented to the atmosphere. Our fuel tank pressure is sealed off. So it's possible that this would be in pressure or vacuum when this test starts. Canister pressure should read atmospheric. We turn the pump on, and like always with Toyota pumps, we run a 20,000th leak check. Great. What do we do then? We, oh, we turn the vent solenoid on. Turning the vent solenoid on means we're checking the entire system. But guys, I need you to know, when I say we're checking the entire system, our door is still closed. Our entire system at that point 
is only the canister side of the system up to our fuel vapor containment valve or our back door. So on the first part of the system, we're only checking canister side. Similar to our intrusive and non-intrusive systems, we are checking each half individually. All right, at that point, if we draw enough vacuum in the system, we open up the purge, and we should see our vacuum decay very quickly, go back to atmospheric. Notice, guys, our fuel tank pressure hasn't changed at all yet because we're not testing it yet. All right, so if we pass on the canister side, if everything is happy with the canister side, we go into a five-second uh, window where we let everything sit in its normal position, then what do we do? We turn on our fuel vapor containment valve. This opens that door. Now our, ca our um, vapor canister and our fuel tank are combined. They're one unit now. All right, so we're checking now the entire system as a whole. So we'll see now our fuel tank pressure and our canister pressure both decreasing. All right, we'll see them both building in vacuum, right? Our system is being tested as a whole now. So our leak detection pump is on, our vent is on. We don't need to do another 20,000th leak because the computer already knows what that looks like from these two. So at this point then, we are, um, we leave this fuel vapor um, containment valve, our bypass valve, whatever you want to call it, our door on until a certain point until we reach our threshold, and then we close it, all right? When we close it, we run the canister side under another 20,000th leak. Now again, we're not actually measuring the canister side at this point, we're just measuring inside of our, our pump assembly on that 20,000th leak. But notice guys, our fuel tank pressure sensor should remain where it sits because our fuel tank pressure sensor is now in an isolated unit. It's in a, it's in a unit like this, that is standalone of the, no, visuals work for me. <laughs> fuel tank, canister, they're now isolated from each other. So our tank should sit under pressure or vacuum as long as there's no change inside of the tank. As long as there's no fuel added, gas cap comes off, um, the fuel changes in temperature, it should remain under vacuum or pressure. But when we shut that valve off, you'll also see at the same time, we shut off our vent solenoid. So at that point, we're no longer measuring vacuum on the entire canister side, we're only measuring against our 20,000th leak. So it just goes ahead and re-verifies and then turns it back off and our system has passed. So there's a lot more um, steps in this, in this system, but it's pretty much what we're used to seeing. We just have to understand which solenoids are turning on at which points. Scan tools are gonna be very good for running this test because you'll be able to see at that exact moment what solenoids are on and off. And then grab this, um, screenshot this off the screen or grab it out of service information and compare the two. Throw it on a lab scope. It only took a few minutes to hook up the scope to the back side of the PCM and look at exactly what we're looking at here. So that's how you're gonna verify that system. Things to watch for on these hybrid closed systems. When the vapor containment valve is closed, so when we have that door closed, we should see separate pressure readings on the canister side versus the tank side. They should be different from each other, all right? When they're open, they should be the same. The system takes from two halves to an entire system. They should read the same. Now. There's a good note here, guys. Because the fuel tank is able to build a substantial amount of pressure, and I don't know what the pressure reading is on the, on the mechanical bypass valve, but it's possible that when you trigger the uh, fuel door button, when you push a button, it might come up on the dash saying, please wait. It might not let you fill up with gas at that exact second. Now, I don't know how long this is going to take, but the dash will say, please wait, because at that point, what it's doing it's opening up our fuel containment valve and it's allowing any pressure that we've built up, if the computer deems that as substantial, it allows that pressure to then be kind of vented off or released into the canister assembly, making it safe for you to pull the gas cap off. If that thing were under pressure, it's possible you pull the gas cap off, you have an eruption of fuel out of the filler neck, okay? Now I would hope, does it show in this diagram? This does have a splashback valve here so we shouldn't ever run into actual fuel leaving the filler neck, but it's, it's another safety feature. So I don't know if you guys have run into this before on a Toyota or Lexus hybrid where you see this, please wait and refill ready. I'd be interested to see how long that takes. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have a spec on that. Um, and then, yeah, so I think that's it for that system. Take a peek at the comments.
Uh, yeah, Keith, I don't have that spec. I know on like the intrusive and non-intrusive systems, it was five inches of water pressure. I was unable to find that spec. If anybody knows, that would be great to, uh, great to know. All right. Oh, you guys are talkative today. Oh yeah, the interaction of live streams is, it's fun being able to hear from you guys right away. So guys, before I go into closing this up, I got a few more slides here just in closing. Was there anything else that you want to see um, with the scan tool hooked up to this Avalon, with the scope hooked up? Was there anything that you wanted demonstrated that maybe you want to see happen real time or you maybe I didn't cover the way you wanted to see it? I'd be happy to go over that now. Otherwise, I'm going to go into these last couple here for some closing thoughts on our Toyota EVAP class. First of all, guys, service information is your friend here. Look at it, read it, figure out exactly what you're working with. Service info, um, description of operation, wiring diagrams, all of that is your friend on these systems. Toyota did not say an 02 is going to run this system, and an 06 is going to run this system, and an 11 is going to run this system. They're hit and miss depending on what you're going to be working on. So definitely look at your service information to figure out what exactly you have in your bay. Scan tool data PIDs may, may not be written properly or what you expect to see. You might see them in PSI, you might see them in KPA, millimeters of HG. Use the conversion uh, tools out on the internet uh, to just do a quick conversion on it. Pretty simple for that. Your scan tool may not control, um, may not display or control properly. This is something we ran into last time when we were controlling that, uh, the solenoids on the um, Camry. We ran into the scan tool saying that the solenoid was turned on when in fact on the lab scope we proved it to be wrong. So be careful with uh, scan tool software potentially lying to you. If it seems like there's something off with your scan tool, just verify it with your scope or your meter before you go throwing parts at it. You don't want to be a parts changer. We want to make sure that we're fixing it first, fixing it right the first time. So don't have 100% faith in your scanner. Make sure that what you're looking at actually makes sense. Uh, some vehicles, again, have a replaceable component, like this uh, leak detection pump of our canister is replaceable separately. Um, other ones, you have to buy the entire canister. Uh, these systems operate very similarly. Uh, as you can see, as we were going through them all today, they all kind of have similar operation principles, especially if they have a vacuum pump on them. So if you achieve this base knowledge, this level of knowledge on the way this thing works, you should be able to apply it to any of these Toyota systems. And uh, like I said to, I believe it was to Tanner earlier, I said Toyota's been very good with sharing service information with us, so use that to your advantage. Pull as much of the OE information as you can. All right, here's a little chart that I put together. Guys, if you want to screenshot this, definitely make it happen. Throw it in a folder on your desktop. This is going to be the six different systems that we've covered and what some expectations are from those systems. So our, for our leak tests for each system, you know, our key off vacuum pump, we're expected a five hour window and it's gonna turn a vacuum pump on. The early bladder system is gonna basically be doing a purge seal test. And then vacuum pump on these two, purge seal and intrusive, and then our non-intrusive is comparing our pressure values. Uh, do we have a bypass VSV and what is it measuring? If it's on or off. Um, and then our fuel tank pressure reading key on engine off. What should we expect to see? Should we expect vacuum or pressure or should we expect to see atmospheric? That's all labeled out here. And then I also threw in here sealed and vented because there's a couple weird things here. Um, so we have sealed systems here where we're building pressure and vacuum, vented obviously atmospheric. Now we have atmospheric on both of our bladder systems, but that's because our bladder is sealed and our tank is vented, okay? So keep that in mind. And then our hybrid closed system, if we're looking at the tank pressure sensor, it is going to read pressure and vacuum and it is going to be sealed. If we are looking at the canister pressure, we should most likely be seeing atmospheric. Okay. Oh, all right, last slide. EVAP class number four, we are going to be continuing on the EVAP train in September. Uh, guys, to note, uh, that will be September 7th, and it is only going to be at 11 o'clock Central Time. We are not going to be doing a 2 o'clock Central Time class anymore from here on out. We are only going to be streaming this uh, live training class at 11 a.m. It will still be available as a recorded video afterwards, so if you guys are unable to make it to this class, if you're a normal two o'clock viewer, come back and join us um, as a video. If you have comments or questions, definitely comment in. I will do my best to get out there and answer them, but we are only going out live at 11 o'clock um, 
for our classes from here on out. All right, let's take a peek at comments, see if there's anything else you guys want me to cover. Can you talk about the fuel level sensor system on the bladder system? Um, which bladder system are you referring to? The first one or the second one? The first one is going to run a single, a single uh, fuel level sensor, and the second system will run a two sensor. So if we look at this again, um, so here is the second, the, the later design one. We actually have a sensor inside of this trap module, and then we also have a sensor here. Um, we're going to be using both of these. This one will be used for our 20,000th leak check, and then this one will be used for the um, actual checking of the system. And then it's going to also compare the two together for that leak check, whereas our early system here, you can see we only have the one sensor. This is just a standard two-wire vent solenoid right here, so there's no fuel tank pressure sensor in here. It is only um, a single sensor right, right here. So I hope that answers that. Um, yeah, uh, William says that he missed the important stuff. He's going to have to go back and watch it again. You can definitely uh, come back on and watch it again. And you know, that's kind of nice. I mean, I've been up here an hour and a half talking, guys. I don't even remember what I said in the beginning. So it's nice that you can go back out and you can watch this again as a video anytime. I've made a EVAP system training playlist on our channel. So if you're looking for EVAP training, go ahead, grab that playlist, and that'll have all of our EVAP related videos in there for training. Oh, fuel level. Sorry, I misread that. Fuel level sensor. Um, Bryn, I wanted to um, leave the fuel level sensor system out of there because there's not a lot of info on it. I didn't find a lot of info on it. You don't see, you don't even see it labeled out here. And from what I've read, the older style Priuses had a problem with the fuel level sensors. I will do a follow up on that. I will try to dig for more information and find out some more on these fuel level sensors. But according to what I've read, the Prius owners kind of complain about their fuel level indicators on these Priuses. But uh, like I said, I'll do some more digging and um, come the Tech Connect episode at the end of the month, I will get into uh, trying to answer that fuel level question. Sorry, I confused that with pressure. All right. Thanks for calling that out, Brian. Thanks for catching it. All righty, anything else I got to cover? I think that's going to be about it, guys. I'm going to go through all these and see if I missed any comments or questions that I have to cover, and then I will answer them in the Tech Connect episode. I really appreciate you guys sticking with me for an hour and a half. I hope you learned a lot about Toyota EVAP. Uh, next month, we're going to be on EVAP again, but on a completely different system. Um, not to give it away, but it's going to be a domestic system on the next one, so uh, one of three choices. So you guys will just have to come and... Uh, see what we're doing next month. So I hope to see you guys all on uh, September, what was that, September 7th, right? Yep, September 7th at 11 a.m. I hope to see you guys there. Thanks for, thanks for uh, sticking with me. Check us out on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All of the links for those are below um, to see what's happening, see what's going on here. Um, also check out the CounterPoint episode that's coming out next week and uh, Tech Connect at the end of the month. So thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you again next time in the Wells Tech Garage. Happy wrenching, everyone.